Happy Friday and welcome to Joy News Today with me, Sweetie Abochi. Coming up in this bulletin, Electoral Commission proposes a 3 p.m. closing time for voting during the December polls. From our because our understanding and thinking is that most of the confusions occur in the night. Former Auditor General Lord's Office of the Special Prosecutor for concluding its investigations into the Airbus scandal. OSP for the boldness of coming out of his position, especially when the investigation is at the instance or the request of the president himself. We'll also bring you updates on what the government has been saying on the back of that old Agoroshi onion market that was demolished three years ago. We've also got business, sports, showbiz and world news in this package. Do stay for details. Many thanks for your time. Starting with, the Institute for Democratic Governance is urging the Electoral Commission of Ghana to publish results of all polling stations before the declaration of final results in the upcoming 2024 presidential and parliamentary elections. Ghana's presidential polls have had a history of electoral petitions at the Supreme Court based on allegations of faulty processes at the polling stations. The Electoral Commission has also come under criticism for declaring the 2020 election results twice, owing to results tallying anomalities. However, the forestall or to forestall such occurrences, which deems as a threat to the country's democracy, Institute of Democratic Governance says all polling stations must or all polling station results must be published on the EC website. My colleague Blessed Soga is at the event and joins us live with more. Blessed, what has the EC been saying on the back of the 2024 elections and polls? Uh, well, the Electoral Commission says the, the last um, polls, of course, had its own challenges, a reason for which they've been reflecting on the outcomes and trying as much as possible to uh, implement some reforms ahead of this year's elections. The demand from the Institute of Democratic Governance is for some reforms uh, to be targeted now at the base of the process, which is the polling stations. Now, the, the, the basic point or recommendation coming through from IDEC is that the polling coalition should be done um, you know, and published on the website of the Electoral Commission ahead of the total tallying and declaration of the results, a reason for which they want all of the issues addressed uh, before the declaration of the results. Do we have any indication of the Electoral Commission agreeing to these suggestions? Uh, the EC says it's the latest time uh, that it could work with and to try as much as possible um, to put together all the figures from the polling stations and publish on its website before the end of the entire process will be the 25-day window which uh, the CI allows for in terms of tallying and the declaration of the presidential results. But as it stands now, uh, they could only do that after they have re uh, results certified and coming through from the regional coalition centers, which is a new uh, format that the EC is introducing ahead of this election. We can listen to Dr. Sribo, who has been uh, addressing the gathering here at IDEC a while ago. So one, as part of the recommendations from the review, the standard one, and the communicator we signed, we, we had wanted to close elections by three o'clock. Because our understanding and thinking is that most of the confusions occur in the night. Most of them. And now that we have decided that no, no police station have more than 750 voters. Some time ago, some used to have even 2,000 at a polling station. Now, 2020, it was, the threshold was 749. This time, 750. No polling station will be more than 750. And with this, it should not take extra hours to, if everybody were to be there on time. And one of the other suggestions too was that we should give some waiver to the female candidates. Because if you look at the parliament, the ladies are less than 10 percent. I don't know what is captured in the affirmative action law. I don't know whether it's going to change the trend, but I'll be surprised. Because 
Because we are, because we are in dem democracy, everybody has the right to contest. But we propose that let's do our part. So we are giving them female candidates and people with disability a waiver of 25% of any fee that will fix. We also decided that the 2020 deposit levels were going to be maintained. We know inflationary and, and the but we said that we'll maintain the same figure. Well, thank you, Blizzard, for bringing us a story. And in other stories, flag bearer of the opposition National Democratic Congress, John Romani Mahama, has vowed to ensure Ghana remains peaceful throughout the December elections and beyond. Addressing the 31st Biennial General Council meeting of the Assemblies of, Assemblies of God Church in the Upper East Region, he said no political ambition justifies the shedding of even a single drop of Ghanaian blood. And so as we go into another election, often there's a general sense of apprehension that something will go wrong. As a member of your church, I can assure you and pledge that I'm a person of peace. And if there's any violence, it won't come from me. I'll do everything to ensure that Ghana remains peaceful. Because if you resort to violence, it is the same people you are coming to govern over. And so I don't think that even a single drop of any Ghanaian's blood is worth political power or coming into office. And so I give you that assurance. We've seen an increase in multidimensional poverty from the uh, Ghana Statistical Services um, uh, recent statistics that they've put out. It means that more of our people are becoming poorer. It says that 8 million of our people in 2023 went one day without food because they couldn't afford it. And so it means that people are hungrier, uh, the hardship is real. And this is the time for us to show compassion to each other. Because in times of poverty, we must be our fellow keeper and share the little that we have. Away from that, former Auditor General Yao Dumelovo has commended the Office of the Special Prosecutor for concluding its investigations into the Airbus scandal. According to him, the boldness to investigate the former president and find no wrongdoing set a good precedent in the fight against corruption. There have been varied reactions to the OSP's report, but first, the New Patriotic Party has condemned the report, describing it as a lazy piece of work. An individual commits a crime outside and you are gathering evidence. What stops you from taking the evidence from there? Is there any law in Ghana that says that you can't pick a judgment of a competent court of jurisdiction in another jurisdiction to establish your case and prosecute your case in your country? Mm. There is no such law. And that is why I say that the OSP has done a lazy job. Because the OSP did a lazy job because you can't conclude by saying that because you don't have the fact at hand, you don't have all the, the, the facts at hand, hence you cannot prosecute that case. Did he go to ask for the judgment? What was the material used in the judgment in the UK? And he says he did. So he could have, he, yeah, he could have done that. He could have done that and get the document. Has he been denied the judgment? No, we no, know how no, a judgment is written. All the, Har Har all Har the opinions on. of judges mm. sitting on the panel will indicate their position and quote the necessary laws to back their decision. Mm. And you would have been able to establish those particular facts. But what is key in Ghana now is that we have an individual who has been confirmed in the UK, and then the special prosecutor has established the case that he is indeed the government official one. Because he was the vice president. He later became president. What was he doing with the contract where it is confirmed by special prosecutor that he was sending emails directly by himself? to Airbus as a company, was he the contractor? Was he the contractor? He was not the contractor. So, so he has no business to be sending emails on such a contract. That is very dubious, very scandalous, very, very bad to the state of Ghana. Now we can hear from former Auditor General Yao Domelevo, who urges individuals with evidence against the report to submit it to the Office of the Special Prosecutor. I think issues of corruption and corruption-related activities is premised on evidence. Mm. If you help the OSP, you say you didn't get the evidence. 
So if anyone has the evidence which the OSP could not uh, find, they should give that evidence to him. He cannot just base upon a hearsay or perception and say, based upon that, I am going to prosecute you. So let me take the opportunity to say that uh, I commend the OSP for the boldness of coming out with his position, especially when the investigation is at the instance or the request of the president himself. Mm. Many public officers may find it difficult to come out and say, you sent me to do this, mm. I didn't uh, find anything. Why I'm saying that is because the president has made it very clear earlier on at one of the bar conferences that there was issues or related to corruption as far as this uh, deal was concerned. An applied economist at West African Center for Sustainable Rural Development says the vice president, Dr. Mahmoud Balmier's call for a broad-based road tolling system is laudable and feasible. Professor Michael Ayamga believes this system will broaden the tax net and could help in developing the country. He was reacting to calls by the governing New Patriotic Party's flag bearer, Dr. Mahmoud Balmier's appeal to stakeholders in the road infrastructure, uh, road infrastructure provision industry, rather, to critically evaluate the opportunities in the financing models for funding road construction projects. Professor Ayamga spoke on Newsdesk. It's feasible, it can work, it should be done. But at this point, the masses are already burdened. And uh, if you are adding it to the e levy, you are going to burden uh, uh, consumers and uh, market women who pay vehicle fares and the rest, the more. So, yes, it will help us expand our revenue mobilization, but there should be a, a carrot for uh, the general public, especially those living at the margins. We need to give them some incentive. Uh, I propose this idea as an alternative to the crippling uh, electronic uh, levy, and uh, it should be taken off and then replaced with this. On the back of the reports we brought to you a few days ago on the demolition exercise at Agogloshi three years ago, which has now um, left many people without livelihood, means of livelihood, government insists that only 12.5 kilometers or 12.5 acres of land, rather, out of the entire 80 acre yard will be used for that modern health facility under the Agenda 111 initiative. And work is actually ongoing. I was there on the grounds earlier this afternoon, and here's a report for you. I'm standing in the middle of that 80 acre yard that reported a few days ago that um, some of the scrap dealers have returned to some. Some of the things we witnessed when we came here were open defecation, drug peddling, and dumping of refuse. Right now, we've seen some contractors here on site, and they said they're digging and filling the land in preparation towards building that modern, agenda, um, modern health facility under the Agenda 111 initiative. I want to speak to one of the contractors or consultants here to shed more light on the activities happening here. Thank you so much for agreeing to speak with us. So please, to set the ball rolling, how long have you been on site and doing this? All right, okay, so um, currently what they are doing is ex excavating to stabilize the site. You realize that there was a lot of contamination here. So um, the best, and apart from that, the ground is not stable. So they are digging, you, have, you see borders around, okay, so they have to do that to, so that they can stabilize the site. Um, I think they started this somewhere in May. However, because of the rain, and uh, you can tell the ground is, is, yeah, so that's where they are. But it's to enable them to get a firm ground so that the buildings will start. But it is not on an 80 acre land. Eh? Yeah, okay, the, the entire this thing, like yeah. you are saying, but the agenda 111 is limited to about 12.5 acres. Okay. Which is part of the 80 which is part of the 80 acre the entire yard is 80 acres but the agenda 111 is only going to be on 12 acres 12.5 12. acres okay. yes and how long have you been here um said you said since may. may and are you here every day of the week as consultants we no, come as, in as, okay. as consultants we come here as and when but however the uh, the contractor is here throughout okay. but like i said because of the rains when the rain started mm. then they had to uh, so because if you had come here during the rain you you will see the pool of water here okay so it means that the days that we came here 
if we didn't cite anyone, it's because they were because of the rain and they couldn't be possibly filling and digging in that situation. Well, I don't know when you came here, and I can't tell the condition. Um, yeah, whether it rained or not. Yeah, I don't know when, so I can't respond to that. Yeah. Okay. So when when should we um, finish the digging and filling of this place? When should we expect um, to see some completion of work? Some completion of yeah. work. It will twenty for for this project for for, for this uh, site. It will be twenty twenty five oh. for the Agobroshi site. It will be twenty because of the stabilization they have to do. If um, it was a normal land and they are starting, it is for twelve months. But for here, they have to finish with stabilizing the ground before. When we have your contact, we can uh, call you. Or you know the site. You can walk in at any time and then uh, check on the progress. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mr. Osai. Did I get the name right? Osai Mr. Osai Akuno, who is a consultant here. Um, and you are in charge of this building, the modern health facility under the Agenda 111. Yes, the consultant supervising the construction. What's the name of your consulting firm? It's uh, CBH Group Limited. Thank you so much for speaking with us. All right, so this is where we are right now. Um, contractors are on site. In other stories, some children with hemophilia have been bedridden following a three-month delay in the delivery of blood components responsible for clotting of blood. Parents of these kids say the Food and Drugs Authority has delayed in releasing documents to facilitate the importation of the donor-sponsored medication. Some of the distressed mothers say further delay in delivery of these medications could lead to the deaths among children living with the condition. There's more in the following report. Hemophilia is a rare disorder in which blood does not clot in a typical way as a patient could bleed for a longer time after an injury. Mothers of children living with hemophilia count it a blessing when their wards make it through the day on head. This is due to the absence of the blood components responsible for the clotting of blood at the Confanoche Teaching Hospital, which serves people with the condition in the northern sector of the country. The concentrates of clotting factor 8 and clotting factor 9 are slowly dripped or injected into the veins of a patient to improve blood clots when injured. Six years ago, Sandra Opoku's newly born baby died after circumcision due to the failure of the blood to clot. Presently, her toddler has a similar condition but has continued to live due to the medical support received. But as the shortage of concentrates linger, Sandra lives in constant fear and worry. Yeah, be na ne ama ye ni a break as a pan is say. So I'll call on for not in Nicole Bois. Your money be break. What is making us very worried is that if you go to Confanochi Teaching Hospital, a lot of our children are in pain after sustaining injuries. Some of them are unable to walk. Some children will have to undergo surgery. But because the clotting concentrate is not available, they can't undergo the surgery. For about three months, we don't have the medication. It is hard to watch on as they bleed. She said, Obasia too. Namuja no basa, and I will name Quain Bia, Obefaso, and Obeji will be Eddie, my. Though the Hemlibra, which is one of the medications for the condition, is available, the factor 8 and 9 remain crucial. According to the Ghana Hemophilia Society, some children are bleeding profusely after being injured due to the absence of the essential medications. Irene Osei is a concerned mother. The whole northern sector, we all come to converge at Confanoche for the factor. So when there is delay like that, you don't, you can't come because when you come, you won't get. So when something happens, the child has to bleed so that if unfortunately something can happen. At times too, there are some dra other drugs that also help clot the, fa the blood. But the factor that we receive for the case normally helps a lot. Without the factor, a lot really happens. The children, some of them can't walk, some of them will be bleeding through their nose and other orifices. Some of them, when their teeth fall out, they'll be bleeding and, and it's so serious that as parents, we are very disturbed that you will just watch your child bleeding and you don't know what will happen. The concerned mothers are blaming the FDA's failure to release a document to access the medication from donors. They are calling for an intervention of stakeholders to halt possible deaths that may result from the situation. Fortunately, we don't buy these drugs. We have a donation from outside that they bring this factor 
and we receive it through Ghana Hemophilia Society too. So we just come to Konfanochi and they give us those drugs. So frankly speaking, we don't buy those drugs. We don't have even some of the markets for us to buy. The concern is that before we get the drugs, we have to take a letter from the Food and Drugs Authority so that we will take the drugs outside to the donors for them to release the drugs for us. But for now, close to about three months now, we've not received the letter to enable us to send it outside for us to receive those drugs. For Joy News, Nanaya Ojima Kumasi. Nanaya Ojima actually joins us live now from Kumasi with more on the story. Nanaya, what's the latest on this development? So the medication is still uh, in short supply at the Kongfu Anochi Teaching Hospital. Uh, this morning I had a conversation with the Ghana Hemophilia Society and according to them they made a request for authorization from the FDA in June. Um, unfortunately they were not able to secure an authorization in July Another, another authorization went in for factor 9 um, medication. Unfortunately, they are yet to hear from the FDA or the FDA is yet to grant the request for authorization. So, um, as I'm speaking to you now, Confuanochi Teaching Hospital is still, um, they do not have the medication in their stores. So they are now relying on um, one other medication which is not as effective as the factor 8 and factor 9 in the treatment of these children with hemophilia. Now the parents of the children are very worried and according to them their prayer is that none of their children is injured or gets um, an injury. But unfortunately already there are some of them who are um, suffering from the consequences of the shortage of this medication. Now this medication is not sold on the market as well. Um, the Ghana Hemophilia Society after getting the authorization from the Food and Drugs Authority are able to work with the donor agency that is the World Federation of Hemophilia and they donate this medication to the hospitals through the Ghana Hemophilia Society. So what the Hemophilia Society is now waiting for is for the, is the Food and Drugs Authority to give them the authorization for the importation of this medication. So much for bringing us updates on this story. Away from that, health authorities in the Techiman municipality of the Bono East region are worried about the increasing number of new HIV cases recorded in the area. Municipal HIV coordinator Mumuni Mohammed says the prevalence of HIV and AIDS, particularly amongst young people, has increased, with the municipality recording a total of 925 new positive cases in 2023. Anas Sabit has more in this report. The prevalence of HIV AIDS amongst adolescents and young people is an issue of ongoing concern. It has been established that adolescents and young people represent a growing share of people living with HIV worldwide. While declining amongst all other age groups, AIDS-related deaths among adolescents have increased over the past decade. Here in the Tichima municipality, a total of 15,227 persons were tested in the year 2023, out of which 925 tested positive for the virus. Mumuni Mohammed is the municipal HIV coordinator. Looking at the situation in Techiman, the current year or the last year, 2023, uh, looking at the raw figures that we have tested or the fight, how we are doing so far, we are able to test about 15,227 pe people who voluntarily came to the hospitals, non-pregnant women. Either they were suspected by the clinician or they came to the hospital themselves or we went to the community to test them. 15,227 were tested. And out of this figure, 925 were positives. So when you look at the positivity rate here, out of the number we have tested and the number that is positive, 6.1% were positives. The youth, according to Mumuni Mohammed, constitute majority of the number of positive cases recorded. This is largely due to their sexually active nature. The youth, Let's say they constitute from 15 to 39 years. The disease is very prevalent among this age group because they are the sexually active. And HIV is common, uh, mostly transmitted through this medium. 
But why is it necessary for one to know his or her HIV status? Municipal Director of Health Services Dr. Kusi Fusuhini says the move would go a long way to help prolong one's life as well as protect the person's family. Knowing your status is not only about you, it's about protecting yourself, protecting your partner, sometimes even protecting your unborn child. For example, if it's a woman who knows their status, they will be put on the antiretroviral medications. When they get pregnant, we even change the medications for them so that we prevent in utero uh, transmission so that the mother doesn't give it to that unborn generation. So these are some of the advantages of knowing your status. He was however quick to caution the general public, particularly the youth, to adhere to the safety protocols and avoid having unprotected sex to stay protected from all sexually transmitted infections. Apart from HIV-1, HIV-2, we also have hepatitis B, hepatitis C, very common sexually transmitted uh, uh, liver uh, uh, viral infections or diseases, which also you are, that I'm sure a lot of people know about hepatitis, so be careful. So maybe you've been even lucky, you are only on one. Because when you're on one and two, even your regimen, your drug regimen may have to change. And then you have hepatitis on top of it. So yes, we know. Some people feel that, oh, once I've I have it there now. Uh, I've been declared, so me too, I'll go unprotected. Yes, you never know who the, the next customer may even be worse than you. And as Sabit, join us. Teach man. Let's stay on some more health stories. And the Kolebu Dialysis Unit um, has been shut for the past 13 days with patients needing urgent care forced to patronize private facilities which charge much higher. And those that cannot afford these private facilities have been left to their own fate. President of the Kidney Patients Association, Bafwa Hinkra, tells Joy News that the facility has reportedly run out of consumables. He is calling on hospital authorities to communicate to them when the facility will be reopened. Let's cross over live to the Kolebu Teaching Hospital where Kenneth Jesse is on standby for us. Kenneth, so what's the latest on the reopening of the facility for kidney dialysis patients? Well, we have uh, tried to get the hospital administrators to speak to in order to understand the reasons behind the closure and when it intends to reopen, but we have been largely unsuccessful. Now, if you come to the place, you see that empty with just two people inside, only the security personnel and the president of the kidney patients association were escorted when we got here. Now, the president of the association tells us that since the closure of the dialysis unit almost two weeks ago, three kidney patients have sadly lost their lives, although we cannot categorically say that they died because of the closure, since he is not a medical expert. Now, he says uh, their members plan on picketing the dialysis unit next week. If the situation persists, because most of their members are fighting for their lives, since the facility was closed, those that can afford the private facilities have had to reduce the number of times they go for the dialysis, and the ones that cannot afford the private facilities are home. So that's the situation when it comes to the dialysis unit at the Kolebu Teaching Hospital. Right. But, Kenneth, have you been able to speak to the hospital authorities on the way forward? Well, as I mentioned at the beginning, we've tried unsuccessfully to speak to them because we haven't been able to uh, get to them. We wanted to understand from them why it has been closed in the first place because the consumables that they say have run out are just the assumption of the patient to say that the last time it was closed, that was what they were told. So they are just assuming that it's because of consumables that they've closed out. They It's time for Business on Joy News today. My name is Winston Taki, and now to our first business story. The Director General of the Social Security and National Insurance Trust, Kofi Osafo Mafo, says the State Pension Trust will improve the performance of its hotels and enhance stakeholder benefits. Speaking at the 2024 Operations and Benefit Conference in Almeida, Mr. Osafo Mafo highlighted the ongoing internal processes aimed at addressing current challenges noting that net investment in the banking and telecom sectors are performing well. The three-day conference seeks to review the scheme's operations 
successes and future strategy. We are going to go back to the drawing board. Okay, we are going to go back to the drawing board and look at ways in which we can improve the performance um, of the hotels. And I think that um, we will definitely come out with uh, different ways to look at that. I think the other point that is also worth making is that, again, it's something that our stakeholders took a very keen interest in. And so we are also going to engage them and listen uh, to ideas uh, they have. And I think that um, we, we can together come up with a, a way forward. But internally, we've started the process and we are going to um, look at alternatives at improving the performance um, of the hotels. I think the point to make is that that is not the entirety of our portfolio. I think it's taking away from all the other um, aspects of SNIT's business. That is not the entirety of our portfolio. Um, if, if I can highlight a few, uh, we are a major shareholder in the banking sector. Uh, the companies we have invested in there are doing very well. Uh, we are a major um, investor in the telecom sector. Our investments there are doing very well. So there are other parts of our investments which are uh, far larger than what we have in the hotels, which are, which are thriving. So I don't want people to leave with the impression or stakeholders to leave with the impression that um, SNIT is all about the hotels. No. Um, there are the investments that are equally doing well, and we don't want that to detract from the good work that we do. Now, moving on, Fidelity Bank Ghana is set to award 15 entrepreneurs under its bootcamp for green tech entrepreneurs in the agri value chain with 1 million cities, according to the Head of Partnership Sustainability at Fidelity Bank, Nanaya Ifriyofuri Kori. The support is to help agri entrepreneurs scale up and grow their businesses to contribute to national development. The Fidelity Green Tech Innovation Challenge Program seeks to empower agricultural entrepreneurs. In all, 15 entrepreneurs will be awarded at the ideation, scale-up and commercialization stages with 60,000 Ghana cities, 100,000 Ghana cities and a 200,000 Ghana cities grant. In an interview, Head of Partnerships and Sustainability at Fidelity Bank, Nanaya Efrio Forikori, reaffirmed the bank's commitment to driving economic growth through support to critical sectors of the economy. So as a bank, um, one of our key areas is providing solutions to the problems nationwide. And we see that the agri sector needs some stimulation and some support. So one of the key things for us from the sustainability perspective is to really provide support towards local economic stimulus. Now, as you already know, we have a project called Fidelity Young Entrepreneurs Fund. And that fund really supports entrepreneurs by providing them with financial support and mentoring. But we decided that we would carve out some support specifically for agriculture. So that's why we decided to have this one million grant, which will be shared with 15 successful entrepreneurs. The director of implementing partner, InnoHub, Nelson Amu, added that innovations by agri-tech entrepreneurs will help address challenges in the sector such as post-harvest losses and enhance food security. If we're looking at food security in Ghana and Africa, we can't keep doing farming and agribusiness the traditional way. There's the need for enhanced technology and innovation that could help really grow what we're doing in that green sector. And so the importance of innovators in the space of food security, in the space of green and agribusiness cannot be very emphasized. They help make efficiency in, in farming and beyond farming, there's also efficiency in post-harvest management and, and what have you. So there is quite a huge opportunity in the space and then the gap is being filled by these entrepreneurs. Uh, however, there's the need for the support. Participants of the boot camp were given trainings to build their capacity and ideas. W04 Business will be back with sports and entertainment after this break. Stay tuned.
Time for Sports on JN Today with me, Haruna Mubarak. We start with a surprising news at ongoing Olympics where world record holder Toby Amusan crashed out of the women's 100 meters hurdles. Amusan shocked the world in 2022 when she set a world record of 12.12 seconds on her way to victory at the world championships. But the 27-year-old was way off that sort of pace and only finished third in her heat behind Grace Stark of the USA and Devin Charlton from the Bahamas. Her time was not good enough to secure passage into the final as one of the fastest losers. And that's your sports on GM Today. My name is Haruna Mubarak. Good afternoon. The showbiz segments with me, Jacqueline and Samar Yabwa. Now to a first story, Afrofuture Festival is turning the tide this year with a fresh twist. Instead of its usual grand festival, the premier celebration of African culture is making its debut event with the launch of Culture Bee Jam. This year, bringing the parties to the beach for the very first time. Since its debut in 2017, Afrofuture has been more than just a festival. It's been a global movement raising funds and building a platform that amplifies African creativity like never before. But this year, they're switching things up. In an exclusive chat with Eddie, a key team member, he spilled the beans on why Afrofuture is trading its usual venue for the waves and sunsets of Accra Polo Beach. I'm Eddie Ampa, I'm the, the current content lady for deviation um we're just trying something different uh we're doing something different um in the sense that there are innovations that we're working on um in collaboration with lwac to make the place better for us for next year we've been doing lwac since 2018 so last year and um so this year we decided to take a break from lwac so we can focus on the renovation plans that we have for LWAC itself as the home of Afrofuture. So it's not a deviation, it's the same festival um, you've always attended, it's the same vibes, same cultural experience uh, that, that we are taking to the Polo Beach shoreline, uh, which is an expansion of Polo Beach. So it's not just the, the usual Polo Beach club, but the shoreline of Polo Beach Club is a bigger space. Uh, we're approx approximately aiming for between 6,000 and 8,000, which is a little less than, you know, what we usually do, which is about 20, 20,000 a day. Do you think you'd be denying some people like the whole Afrofuture experience? Um, denying in what sense? What, because no, the like numbers limiting are... the number? Um, yeah, it's not necessarily limiting. It's just the space for us. We felt uh, Polo Beach Shoreline would be a great experience because it's a big space. Uh, it's not as big um, as L Whack. Well, Joy Prime's Big Chef tertiary audition train has made its first stop at the Tamale Technical University. And as the clock ticks closer to the start of the much anticipated cooking competition, the students are gearing up with a blend of excitement and determination. <laughs> It's day three of the most loved culinary battle among tertiary schools. It's Big Chef Tertiary Audition Train and it's finally landed in Tamale Technical University. The environment is buzzing with excitement as the competition draws near. Participants have been sharing how prepared they are towards today's task. The competition is expected to be fierce, with every participant bringing their unique flair in the kitchen. Supporters of the various teams had something to say. I believe in them and they are so fascinated. Like, they, they have been so driven to us. Right. So we are expecting the best from them. But they are exceptional. And then they are, they are, they are four female and females. And then our coaches are recording with man and they will not go there. That's they're coming together. They put their resources together and they back them. We will give them the number that for us. Everything motivation, everything. We will give our best to make, them, make sure they win. 
as the competition begins, all eyes will be on participants who are ready to make a mark in this culinary journey. So catch up with us at 3 p.m. on Joy Prime for all the details. On that playlist update note, is a wrap for the showbiz segment with me, Jacqueline, and Samaya Boa. Over to you, CT. I'm still hearing the Panadol song in my head. I know, head. right? It's just jamming. It's jamming to it for a little bit. <laughs> but that's all we have for you for this afternoon, the Friday edition of Joy News Today. And for more news, log on to myjoyonline.com. Over there, you find latest stories like teacher trainees demand temporary closure of 46 colleges, over eight weeks tax strike, and other stories for your viewing and reading pleasure. Thank you so much for watching. We're back on your screens again on Monday. For now, it's bye from me.